and then they don't round the band stuff for for K Root, so um, that makes it more interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll hand you over to Anand, um, who will talk about K Root's plans. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Anand Butadev. Um, I represent the RIPE NCC, and I'm the manager of uh, DNS services there. Um, and this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what KROOT is doing to prepare for a signed root zone. A little bit about the RIPE NCC. I'm sure most of you know us, uh, but in case you don't, we're one of the five regional internet registries, and we um, allocate IP address and AS number resources to our members. Um, we also operate uh, the reverse DNS zones for all this IP address space that we allocate. And more interestingly for this presentation, we are also one of the 13, uh, w we operate one of the 13 uh, root DNS servers called KROOT. We have an Anycast cluster of 18 instances and more information about this is available on the KROOT homepage. Um, just a very, very quick introduction uh, about DNS. I'm sure most of you know this stuff. It's a service that translates names into IP addresses. It's been around for a long, long time. It's an old protocol, 25 years old or so. And um, one of its features is that it uses UDP for transport. And this is mainly for low overhead. UDP doesn't have any state, is um, <coughs> quick. And so it was chosen as the primary transport for, U for DNS. And way back when this uh, protocol was invented, uh, there was a limit on the DNS payload. And this was set at 512 bytes. I highlight it here because um, we're going to come back to this in the presentation. DNS is very, very essential to the working of the internet, and so it's not a good idea to mess around with it. Um, DNS was invented way back when the internet was a nice, friendly place, and uh, there weren't so many hackers around, and there weren't so many security problems. Uh, but since then, things have been changing. Um, the internet has become a more evil place. And DNS has several issues, several problems. Um, it's based on UDP, which allows address spoofing. This allows any hacker on the internet to send uh, DNS queries out to authoritative servers with spoofed addresses and have the replies go back to uh, a victim. Uh, neither the transport <coughs> nor the content uh, is secure. There's no cryptography in, in DNS at the moment. And um, so it's not possible to verify whether the answers that you're getting are uh, genuine or not. There's also uh, limits in the protocol itself. Uh, the, the query ID which is used uh, to track DNS uh, queries and replies is limited to 16 bits. Um, and there's this 512 byte uh, limit on the payload. So there's not that much data you can squeeze in a packet. And the, all these limits put together, um, combined with fast hardware and networks these days, makes it easy for hackers to do all kinds of evil things with DNS, misdirect clients, steal their accounts, passwords, all sorts of things. So you know, we all rely on DNS, and we need it to work right, and we need to solve these problems. So one of the solutions to this is DNSSEC. Um, it's been in development uh, at the IETF for about 10 years now. Um, it's taken several iterations to work out all kinds of issues, solve all kinds of problems. Um, it introduces cryptographic um, uh, security into DNS, and it uses public key cryptography. The idea is that uh, there's a key in two parts, a public component and a private component. The public, uh, the private component is used to sign content 
and publish data. And the public component of this key is available to clients to verify the data. I won't go into any more details about DNSSEC. There's several tutorials, books, um, websites that one can go to to learn more about DNSSEC. So uh, DNSSEC has consequences. Security doesn't come cheap, it comes at a price. And one of the things that uh, DNSSEC introduces is large responses. That's because um, there are signatures along with data and so packets become bigger. Um, many sites, uh, many um, uh, devices, a lot of software doesn't understand uh, packets bigger than 512 bytes and might fall back to TCP. Um, that's, not, uh, uh, that's not very practical on the internet uh, for DNS because of the large volume of queries. So the IETF also went away and worked on DNS uh, extensions to allow for these large packets. They went away and uh, created EDNS0. And the idea behind EDNS0 was that a client could signal to a server that it could handle big packets. The server, in turn, can uh, send out uh, DNS replies which are bigger. That's the theory. The practice is, uh, I the, the, the in practice, it's uh, not the same. Um, things don't work. There's devices, as Keith mentioned, out there, um, home, home Soho routers, CPs, which don't know about um, large DNS packets or fragments. Um, limited uh, MTUs on a, on a path uh, between a server and a client can cause fragmentation of DNS packets. The packet is broken into smaller fragments, and these don't always make it through. Um, and if a router along the path fragments a packet, it generates an ICMP message back to the origin server to say fragmentation uh, is required. Um, these ICMP messages don't always make it back to the server because many networks filter ICMP um, for security reasons. And as I mentioned earlier, TCP fallback isn't practical because um, of the volume of queries and also because many DNS uh, authoritative servers are operated in any cast networks and uh, pop switching, that's where a client switches from one any cast instance to the other, can cause trouble for that client where TCP queries time out. Um, so DNS, um, DNSSEC is considered by the IETF um, and the industry experts to be mature enough now, and it's been um, agreed that it's uh, good enough for the DNS root zone. So in 2009, uh, the NTIA, which is um, a, a part of the Department of Commerce, uh, they asked the IANA and uh, VeriSign to come up with a plan for signing the root zone. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of progress has happened since then, and the results are available on this website. Uh, ICANN and VeriSign are also posting regular updates here. And ICANN and VeriSign are working with uh, the 12 operators of the 13 root service to publish this signed root zone. So this, um, this uh, rollout is going to happen in stages. And this is to avoid a big bang situation. We don't all want to wake up one day with a signed route and complete chaos and mayhem on the internet. Uh, the idea behind this is that if a client has problems getting responses, uh, large responses from a server that has a signed route, it can switch to uh, a server that is serving a non-signed route and at least continue to receive service. And in the meantime, if the client has noticed problems, uh, they can do something to upgrade their network or their software to uh, work with um, larger packets. At the same time, it gives a very sign I can and researchers um, time to observe the effects of this deployment and make informed decisions. Uh, something that's um, that Keith has already mentioned, the DERS, the deliberately unverifiable root zone. Uh, this um, this means that the root zone uh, will be signed, 
but then the actual key will be um, uh, changed. Uh, they, they will fiddle with the bits and make the key unverifiable or unusable rather. And the idea is that no one can depend on this key for any uh, verification purposes. Um, it's to stop people configuring the key into their resolvers and become dependent on a signed root. Because if there are problems and the signed root has to be withdrawn in an emergency, then uh, we don't want service to break for those people who might have configured the keys. So it, it allows uh, a signed root to be deployed. It allows us to exercise our software, our firewalls, our networks without actually uh, enabling the service. And on the 1st of July, if everything's gone well, um, and, uh, uh, the green, uh, and the green light is given, then uh, real keys will be published. So at, uh, <coughs> at the RIPE NCC, we're doing lots of things to prepare KROOT for this, uh, this uh, event. Uh, we're doing lots of things. One of the things that we're doing is upgrading our NSD software. Uh, KROOT, unlike many of the other root operators, uh, runs NSD. Um, and we've, um, we asked the developers for some new options. Uh, we'd like to be able to tune the number of TCP connections that NSD can handle. In the past, uh, this used to be a fixed limit, and we'd, we wanted it to be tunable. And the other thing um, that this new version of NSD does is to clear the DF bit. Um, uh, previous versions of NSD uh, didn't do anything special, which let the Linux kernel set the DF bit. What this means is that large packets which were going out onto the internet uh, could not be fragmented, and so routers would send back a fragmentation needed uh, ICMP message. Um, but this ICMP message may not always reach the origin server. So uh, we're going to deploy this new version that allows routers to fragment larger packets. Sorry, I seem to have switched the slide. Um, we're also doing network upgrades. Uh, we know that uh, with assigned root, uh, responses will be larger, and therefore we'll need more outgoing bandwidth from our uh, name servers. So at some instances, we're upgrading from fast Ethernet connections to gigabit Ethernet connections. Um, and we've also been cooperating with NLNet labs to do uh, some load testing on NSD. Uh, particularly with the signed route, uh, so that we have an idea of uh, what our limits are in terms of TCP connections and UDP connections. We're also doing lots and lots of data collection. Uh, we use a tool called DSC, which Keith also mentioned, uh, and we've recently upgraded that to be able to gather uh, TCP connection statistics. Uh, we've also enhanced our um, PCAP filters to capture TCP uh, queries and responses. So we run a continuous TCP dump process on all KROOT instances to capture queries. Uh, and up until recently, we were only focusing on UDP. Uh, now we're also going to watch for TCP. Uh, we also have a special uh, PCAP filter uh, for uh, KROOT, where we capture just the priming queries and we're collecting these uh, uh, on, a, on a server in, at the RIPE NCC. And um, at regular intervals, when the, publish, uh, when the signed root is published on a new root server, uh, all the root operators will be uploading PCAP <coughs> data to OARC and will be taking part in this. Um, and finally, we have deployed something called a reply size tester um, at uh, the global instances of KROOT. And this is software that uh, was written by Dwayne Wessels of OARC. And it allows a client out on the internet uh, to send a special query and get back responses telling that client about um, what the limits of their resolver are. So you can, um, you can run this query using this simple Unix uh, dig uh, tool. Um, and you can um, optionally specify a resolver to test. 
Um, it gives you back an answer and gives you some ideas about um, how large a packet you can receive, or rather your resolver can receive. Uh, we've also done a slightly sneaky thing here. We've embedded a bit of HTML in um, some of the web pages of the RIPE uh, website. Uh, and this uh, bit of HTML triggers this query every time somebody visits our web page. And this allows us to collect all kinds of statistics about uh, reply sizes. Um, we also have written a Java-based application which uh, allows uh, a user to run this query. If, if a user is not very technical and doesn't know what dig is or how to use it, they can still download this Java application and run it on their uh, computer. On It'll work on Mac, Windows, Linux, any, any uh, system that has a JVM. Uh, and it basically does the same test and gives back um, you know, a report. And it helps users figure out um, what the limits are of their resolvers. Um, so a user, once having uh, used this uh, tool, uh, this reply size uh, test tool, and figured out what the limits are of the network, uh, should tune their network uh, to be able to um, work well with assigned root. Now bind and unbound, uh, when, when being used as resolvers, uh, use a uh, buffer size of 4096 bytes. This is the default. But this value doesn't work for everyone because uh, they might have path empty limits of 1500 if they're on an Ethernet network. And so um, uh, users who find that their networks have limits should do some tuning. If they're using bind, they can use uh, this option, the uh, EDNS UDP size option to lower the size of the buffers that uh, they're advertising to servers. Uh, the same thing for unbound, uh, starting from version 1.4.0. Uh, it has an option to be able to tune buffer sizes. Uh, one other thing that uh, users should uh, uh, do is check whether their network and their uh, software allows TCP for DNS. A lot of uh, users mistakenly think that TCP isn't necessary but it becomes even more necessary now because if they can't, if they can't get big packets through, uh, the resolver might have to fall back to TCP and then um, you, know, you need TCP. If TCP isn't there, then you, know, you have no DNS service at all. Uh, there is a silver lining. There are some resolvers out there that just don't know about DNSSEC at all. They're completely and blissfully unaware. And if you have such a resolver, you will see um, uh, a report from the reply size test tool that says um, EDNS equals zero, uh, DO equals zero, which means that this resolver is not advertising any EDNS options or the DNSSEC OK bit. Uh, these resolvers will not be affected by a signed root. They're blissfully unaware. <laughs> they will continue to receive unsigned responses as they previously did. Examples of such resolvers are PowerDNS, the recursor, and DJB DNS. So if you're using one of these, uh, you don't have to worry. You don't get the benefits of DNSSEC either, but you know this whole event of the root signing will not affect you. Also, if you happen to be using bind and you actually explicitly turn off DNSSEC with the, with the option DNSSEC enable no, then again, you're not affected by uh, assigned root. Finally, the RIPE NCC is uh, also busy with a large PR campaign. We're trying to uh, introduce a, a lot of awareness about this whole event, DNSSEC and uh, the root signing. Um, that's simply because there's a, a large number of people out there who simply don't know uh, what's going on and um, don't or, or if they might have heard that the route will be signed but don't know what to do to prepare for it so we're trying to go out there we're trying to do presentations we're writing articles on ripe labs which is uh, something that we've recently launched uh, and try we're trying to encourage discussion and provide advice there uh, and we're trying to, yes, do as much outreach uh, to the networking communities, the ISPs, um, 
and we aim to uh, keep doing this uh, throughout this uh, period until the route is finally signed and real keys are published and perhaps after that as well. So that's uh, basically what the RIPE NCC is doing and I'm happy to take questions. Question? It's not my question. Um, I'm glad that um, I wasn't asked this question. <laughs> um, it's, it's a question of the IRC room. Um, doesn't DNSSEC with UDP also create an additional attack vector for amplification attacks? Are there any recommendations for how to mitigate this? Specifically, Dan Bernstein has recorded an excess of 30 times amplification for unauthenticated stateless queries. Um, it's true. Uh, DNS has always had this problem. You can always send a little query, a little priming query of about 20 or 30 bytes and solicit a large 512 byte response from an authoritative server. So um, the introduction of DNSSEC doesn't bring in a new problem. It's only making an existing problem slightly worse. So instead of, <laughs> instead of 512 bytes, you might be soliciting 800 byte packets, per, uh, perhaps. It's an old problem. It's been around for ages. Um, there are several things that network operators should be doing, um, such as um, uh, filtering on their networks to prevent spoofed packets from going out. They should implement BCP38. Um, and that will go some way towards preventing this problem. but. It, Essentially, it's, it's, it's a problem that's been around and, and there aren't any easy solutions to it, I'm afraid. Um, and yes, DNSSEC will make it a little bit worse, but, you know, it's always been there. I don't know if that answers your question. We won't know for about 10 seconds because there's that much lag between the webcast okay. and the... Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess Keith answered some of the other questions, so... I mean, my, my answer to that question was, more ISPs need to implement BCP38. Yes. Um, so. Okay, any other questions? Right. Okay, thanks everyone thanks for listening. Anand.